Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, economy, financial services and markets. I'm Lizzie Burden in London. Now, after years of tension, could UK-China relations begin to thaw? Britain's Foreign Secretary James Cleverley is using a trip to Beijing this week to mend ties with the world's second largest economy. It's the first visit by a senior UK minister in five years. He spoke to Bloomberg in Beijing yesterday. This is my first trip to Beijing, but I'm having a, a, a continuation of meetings that I have had with senior representatives of the Chinese government since I've become foreign secretary. And this is about uh, engaging directly with the Chinese government, building lines of communication, uh, addressing the areas where we have disagreements, but also looking at opportunities to work together on some of the major issues affecting both our countries and the world, whether that be uh, climate change, the resolution of the war in Ukraine. So, Britain's trying to improve a relationship that's been strained by issues including London's response to a crackdown on democracy activists in Hong Kong, human rights concerns and, more recently, the war in Ukraine. An improvement in ties would offer both countries some relief as they look to boost their sluggish economies. China was the UK's second largest trading partner last year after the US, with more than $132 billion of two-way commerce. Well, let's discuss the significance of the UK Foreign Secretary visit now with Bloomberg's Sofia Orta e Costa. Sofia, great to have you with me. You're back on British soil after years of reporting on China. Not to uh, <laughs> be too blunt, but what does Beijing think of Britain? Does it care? It, it's a good, I mean, it's a good signal that a senior minister from uh, the UK is visiting China. I think this is a, an important, sends an important message to Beijing that the UK wants to re-engage, not just on the diplomatic front, which I think garners most of the attention here, but actually the economic front is probably more important for China. Um, obviously, the US visit took most of the headlines and that's kind of garnering more interest on the ground. Uh, but again, re-engagement and a little bit less of a sparring of words uh, from both sides has been taken positively. I think just the visit in itself, um, after it was cancelled uh, earlier a few weeks ago because the uh, foreign minister in China disappeared and then was replaced, again, is just restarting the dialogue after years of, of just kind of exchanging barbs has gone down well. And not to sound like a needy chick, but where's this relationship going? I think that might depend more on the UK than it does on China. I think China has really signaled that it is open to dialogue as long as the UK stops meddling in, it, in what China sees to be its internal affairs. Obviously, Hong Kong falls into that. Um, the UK also comments uh, on Taiwan following whether the UK or is following the US uh, position on, or, on that or not remains to be seen. The US is obviously um, been uh, a, a lot more problematic on that front for Beijing. Uh, but also uh, important to the UK and important to China is the conversation around Ukraine. We know that Putin is set to visit China, so China is really trying to position itself as the neutral actor there. Um, you know, where does this leave us and how is China going to react? The first visit uh, that Putin makes to the mainland um, since before he invaded Ukraine. But again, for China, the importance will be on the economic uh, cooperation and any kind of more friendly tone coming out of Beijing uh, after this meeting. And do you think that this visit might be reciprocated? Could we see Xi on British soil for the AI summit in November? I would say that's unlikely. Xi has uh, proven unwilling to leave China. He much uh, prefers having people visit him. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a change. I mean, he did go to Russia. That was one of the few um, trips that he made abroad. There could be perhaps a face-to-face -face meeting between Rishi Sunak uh, and Xi Jinping. That could be, um, uh, you know, that, that's something that people are looking for. But a Xi visit to London, I, I think, you know, especially uh, after we had those headlines over the, the Chinese embassy and where that could be uh, here in London, I, I think it's unlikely anytime soon. Well, we await that visit with bated breath. Sophia <laughs> Horta e Costa, thank you for joining me. So, Foreign Secretary James Cleverley has been attempting to reset relations with China, including on trade. And we can speak to someone now who's intimately involved in UK-China trade. That's Julian Fisher, Chair of the British Chamber of Commerce in China. Julian, great to have you Hello. with me. Are you pleased with how the visit's gone? 
Yeah, I think that there was a really positive reception from the Chinese side, which I think is really important in the media here. You know, a lot of coverage on the news in the newspapers. Um, and I think that also um, the messages that he was coming out with, the kind of protect, the line, engage, I think that that goes down well, too. I think China, just as much as the UK, wants to understand each other. They, they want to see where the red lines are. Um, and certainly, I think there was a lot of positivity coming through this trip. So you say it went well. Should it have happened sooner? You know, James Cleverley has been following in the footsteps only of Olaf Scholz and Emmanuel Macron. I think it is a little bit overdue. You know, the Europeans and the Amer Americans have certainly been out here in numbers and, and we've waited. Um, you know, we shouldn't forget that our relationships are embedded enormously and, and it shouldn't be that strange for a foreign secretary from the UK to travel to China. It should be something normal. Uh, it's the second biggest economy on earth. A, a little bit delayed. Obviously, there were some incidents that led to that, but I, I think now that it's happening, hopefully we'll see a lot more visits from foreign um, um, I mean, British um, government ministers coming to China. Mm. Well, the US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said on her visit to China that it's, quote, uninvestable because it's too risky. And she said that what businesses need is a more predictable regulatory environment. I wonder whether that's a view shared among British businesses. So we do a sentiment survey every November. Uh, and last year, um, pessimism about doing business in China quadrupled. From, from 2021 to 2022, it went from about 9% to 42% of British businesses were pessimistic. Now, obviously, that was down to zero COVID. We asked them in March, and there was a lot more positivity. That positivity has now retracted a little. Obviously, there's a slowdown here in the economy. Um, we sort of said that there's conditional optimism in our position paper that we put out in May. And what that means is that businesses, British businesses here, feel quite positive still. There's a lot of growth in the market. There's a lot of opportunities. But it's conditional on regulatory change. It cannot be words anymore. It, it must be that the government follows through with, with the, 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 the things that they're talking about, especially at the highest levels that we've seen come out. You know, a lot of nice words, but I think now we need to see action. Yeah, nice words. The European Chamber of European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, I should say, uh, says that there's quote promise fatigue among foreign businesses in China, skepticism over whether meaningful supports on the way from Beijing. I wonder whether British private business is more optimistic than before. Certainly, I think there's a lot more optimism. Um, you know, we had a board meeting on Tuesday and, and around the room, there was a sense that maybe overseas it was being slightly overdone, uh, the degree to which the economy was here in trouble. Clearly, there are sectors such as property that are going through significant challenges. But, you know, looking at other areas of growth like healthcare and the electrical, electric vehicle market, you know, we're seeing significant investment here and growth and now exports. So it's very difficult, I think, to generalize that, that the entire Chinese economy is either good or bad. I think that generally we're seeing that there are bright shoots in certain areas, but certainly for British businesses, we need to see a level playing field. We need to see that we're welcomed and that we're open to government procurement and that we can access all of the opportunities that are here. Because I think as, as the EU said, with promise fatigue, after all these years, there is some concern that, that maybe, you know, with talk of self-sufficiency, talk of made in China 2025, that, that British business investment is wanted, but maybe that, that, that can't lead to long-term sustainable growth for British businesses in market. Do you feel listened to by the Beijing government and the British government, for that matter, on UK-China trade? So before, I think we, uh, we, we were just after you yesterday speaking to James Cleverly. So we definitely feel listened to, I think, from the UK side. In terms of the Chinese side, I was in a government meeting last Thursday. Uh, the, one of the main five issues that I raised that I think needed to be changed was around individual income tax, which will really affect a lot of foreign businesses in China, hiring a foreign talent. Um, they announced on Monday that they have now delayed reform of individual income tax for another four years. Now, whether or not that was down to that one meeting, uh, it certainly seems that we have this real opportunity where the Chinese government is aware that there are tensions with foreign countries. It's aware that there are challenges in the economy and it wants to be seen uh, to be making changes. And then, so now seems as good a time as any uh, for British business in terms of advocacy and, and lobbying the Chinese government. All right. Thank you for joining us. Julian Fisher, chair of the British Chamber of Commerce in China. Coming up, we're going to get the view from across the pond on US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo's China visit. We'll speak with Elizabeth Raw, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. We agree to 
establish a new commercial issues working group, a formal working group, which will involve U.S. and Chinese government officials, and very importantly, U.S. and Chinese commercial private sector representatives, as we seek solutions on trade and investment issues and to advance U.S. commercial interests in China. So that was the U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo there during her visit to China this week. She won a promise to revive business talks between Washington and Beijing, which is a key step as both sides look to ease tensions. But American firms are left wondering whether that's going to be enough to recommit to a market that looks increasingly risky. So let's discuss this potential thawing of relations between China and the West and what it could mean for the UK with Elizabeth Braw, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Elizabeth, lovely to have you on. We just heard there from Raymondo on her China visit. Is there appetite in DC for a rapprochement with Beijing? There is, and if, if only because there is no alternative at the moment to, to the Chinese market, both as a, as a manufacturing location and uh, a and, and massive part of, of Western company supply chains, but also as, as, a, as a market for uh, sales by Western companies. But we should remember that that the main message that Secretary Raimondo had was that China has become invest uninvestable, and that has nothing to do with anything, any Western government has done that has something to do or everything to do with what the Chinese government has done that has so frightened uh, Western companies that 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 they don't feel it's wise uh, that many of them don't feel it's it's wise to, to put more money into China. So to create the predictable regulatory environment in China that Gina Raimondo says businesses want to see what would Beijing have to do in your view? But it's not just about a regulatory environment, it's about an environment where companies don't have to worry that they'll become uh, random targets uh, of political messaging by, by the Chinese authorities. So if we look at the Western consultancies that have been raided, uh, that was uh, there was no way for them of knowing that, that they might be raided simply because they thought they were doing everything by the book and we still don't know why they were raided. Uh, there is also, there have also been uh, the cases, for example, of, of Ericsson, which mysteriously lost um, also its share in uh, contracts with China Mobile declined after Sweden had decided not to use Huawei in 5G. So if you have that sort of environment where you, you as a company feel that the government can retaliate against you uh, as, a, as a way of, or as, as, as a proxy for your home government, then companies will say it's just too risky. So that's the politicians, but what about insurers? Are they doing enough to uh, give companies the guarantees they need to insure against the political risk of doing business in China? Yeah, so political risk insurance really is the lifeblood of globalization. It's something that has, uh, it's a form of insurance that has exploded uh, along with this latest wave of globalization that started in the late 80s, simply because companies uh, need uh, protection uh, in order to uh, expand into markets that are not liberal democracies, and that's uh, that's has been working really well. And and uh, now in in the past couple of years, companies have discovered that that they 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 really want political risk insurance in China again because of precisely because of what we've been discussing this uh, increasing. Uh, unpredictability and, and even vindictiveness by the Chinese government. So they have um, uh, they have the, the number of companies wanting political risk insurance is increasing. But at the same time, political risk insurers are saying uh, it's, it's too risky for us to insure. So out of the 60 companies that offer political risk insurance, only a few uh, still offer it for China and then only under very strict conditions. So we've just had this visit from the UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly to China, also of the US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. From where you're sat, how does the UK and US approach uh, on China differ? I think definitely James Cleverly was a bit more conciliatory, whereas Gina Raimondo spelled out exactly what the situation is. China has become uninvestable. And it's good that they, that they both travel to, to China to meet with their counterparts and, and others, simply because we, uh, it, 
in order for the world to solve its intractable problems. We need this dialogue. But if they think, and I think especially James cleverly seemed to think that this will revive commercial ties between uh, the UK and China, companies uh, think for themselves and, and uh, it will take a lot more for them to become reassured than, than a visit by, by a cabinet secretary uh, as productive as the meetings may have been. Yeah, I believe it was you who said that they'd be sorely mistaken if James Cleverly thought that this would improve trade, this visit. But the UK uh, Foreign Affairs Select Committee chair has said that Cleverly now needs to go on to Taiwan. And, of course, Nancy Pelosi's already been there. I wonder what you think could be gained from more of these visits when the risk seems to be more provocation. That's right. Every time a Western politician goes to Taiwan, or indeed every time a senior Taiwanese politician meets with a Western counterpart in the West, then you see retaliation against uh, Taiwanese companies, most recently against uh, Taiwanese mango farmers. So uh, it is a risk uh, to go there. And and we should remember that that's why West, senior Western politicians haven't gone to Taiwan for many years. They didn't want to uh, risk retaliation by China against uh, against their private sector. And, and now more seem to be willing to risk it. Uh, we have seen, for example, uh, Central European uh, politicians go to, to Taiwan and indeed politicians from the Baltic states. So they are sort of testing the waters. And I think perhaps James Cleverly will be looking at them and, 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 and taking uh, cues from the, the effect or the harm that such visits, their visits may have done to their private sectors. Um, but I, I, it doesn't seem to me, me that, that he is willing to risk that at the moment. But it, it is good to have be in, a, in an alliance of friends. You can, you can play different roles. And the Baltic states and the Czech Republic in particular have been uh, on the forefront of, of uh, engaging more with Taiwan. All right, thank you for joining us. Elizabeth Braw, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Great to have you. Coming up, can the UK Prime Minister soothe relations with China while keeping the Hawks happy at home? We'll discuss the challenge for Rishi Sunak next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg UK. I'm Lizzie Burden in London. Now, the Foreign Secretary's trip to China could set the stage for the first one-on-one -on -one meeting between Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Chinese President Xi Jinping. The British Premier remains the only G7 leader who hasn't yet met face-to-face -face with Xi since China lifted its COVID curbs. Sunak is trying to repair ties with Beijing without upsetting China hawks in his ruling Conservative Party, who've called for a harder line against the country. To discuss, joining me now is Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson. Ros, there have been no face-to-face -face meetings between the top British officials and Chinese leaders since Theresa May visited Beijing in 2018. Why start now? Well, of course, there was COVID, which meant that no one was going to China. And China was the last country to lift, really, these heavy uh, COVID protocols. Chinese officials were not traveling in turn. So it was a period where no one was meeting with anybody. But as you say, there's been an extra sort of element for the UK, which is the delicate question, really, of Hong Kong. Um, and given the history of the UK with Hong Kong, the crackdown that we've seen in Hong Kong, the national security law made it extra difficult for British officials to be seen, to be with officials from China and meeting one one and really put an extra strain on that relationship. Perhaps now there's a realisation this is still the world's second biggest economy. It's very hard not to engage at all and you really do need to have those conversations going. And also perhaps the element of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, concern about China's position there, the need to keep talking with China about it and certainly the concern about the relationship between Russia and China being super tight. So perhaps the UK is saying we've got a role there to try and keep engagement with China going. And so that's probably some of the factors that are behind that decision. Yeah, so as Elizabeth Braw was saying, it's something of uh, a no alternative situation at this point. I wonder how you would compare Rishi Sunak's policy on China with his predecessors, because surely this isn't a golden era like it was under the 
former Chancellor George Osborne. Well, no, pictures of beers in pubs or anything. But no, it's sort of a thread the needle approach, a bit of pragmatism, and not that dissimilar really to the policies of Theresa May and Boris Johnson. It's sort of like putting things in compartments, caution about some inbound investment from China into the UK, certainly national security concerns over some money, but also that kind of broader level engagement going on. And certainly on global issues, again, AI, climate change, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and having that dialogue going. So it's really sort of a version of what we saw under Theresa May and Boris Johnson. Certainly no return to the effusiveness, the overly perhaps effusiveness of the Cameron era. And just briefly, this morning we've seen the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace replaced with Grant Shapps. You mentioned Ukraine. Where does it leave the UK's approach to the war? Well, probably not that dissimilar to under Ben Wallace. Of course, the issue was Ben Wallace was pushing really heavily for big increases in defence spending in the UK and seemingly frustrated about that. And we saw the signs about Shaps. He went to Ukraine only recently and was posting his comments from that. Certainly, he's very close with Rishi Sunak, so it's probably business as usual in terms of the UK support for Ukraine. All right, thank you to Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson for that look at uh, the impact here on the UK-China ties. Up next, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Simone Foxman and in New York, in New York and Danny Berger here in London. That's coming for you next. This is Bloomberg.